Welcome to the 225th of the COVID Calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. I'm coming to you live from Daejeon, South Korea. Today is a discussion as part of the partnership with the LePage Center for History in the Public Interest of Villanova University, continuing those discussions today. Topic today is the history of plague and new perspectives on that research with Monica Green and Tunahan Dermaz. Just a reminder, you can catch COVID Calls live every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time on YouTube. Just go to the COVID Calls YouTube channel to watch. You can also watch COVID Calls on Facebook Live, Twitch, and Periscope. You can hear COVID Calls anytime recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can also keep up with COVID Calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID Calls. Please do help spread the word and send suggestions for future guests and future topics, and please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. As of today, February 22nd, 2021, there are 2,471,494 deaths globally from COVID-19. That's according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. There are 499,902 deaths reported in the United States. That's up from 495,015 reported on Friday. Major newspapers in the United States already marking the 500,000 death milestone, as you may have seen over the weekend. China reports 4,636 deaths from COVID-19. As a way to bring some humanity to the numbers, I've been reading a life story or a story of advocacy for those impacted by the pandemic, and I'd like to continue that now. The headline is, in pandemic, clergy risk illness, even death, to minister to the sick and their loved ones. This was written by Bruce Alpert and appeared February 21st, 2021, in the Washington Post. The Reverend Jose Luis Garoya survived typhoid, fever, malaria, a kidnapping, and the Ebola crisis as a missionary in Sierra Leone, only to die of COVID-19 after tending to members of his Texas church who were sick from the virus and the grieving families of those who died. Garoya, 68, who served at El Paso's Little Flower Catholic Church, was one of three priests living in the local home the Roman Catholic order of the Augustinian Recollects who contracted the disease. Garoya died two days before Thanksgiving. He was aware of the dangers of COVID-19, but could not refuse a congregant who sought comfort and prayers when that person or a loved one fought the disease. Had retired hairstylist Maria Luisa Placencia, one of the priest's parishioners. He could not see someone suffering or worried about a child or a parent and not want to pray with them and show compassion, Placencia said. Arroyo's death underscores the personal risks taken by spiritual leaders who comfort the sick and their families, give last rites, or conduct funerals for people who have died of COVID-19. Many also face challenges in leading congregations that are divided over the seriousness of the pandemic. Ministering to the ill or dying is a major role of spiritual leaders in all religions. Susan Dunlop, a divinity professor at Duke University, said COVID-19 creates an even greater feeling of obligation for clergy because many patients are isolated from family members. People near death often want to interact with God or make things right, Dunlop said, and a clergy member can help facilitate that. Such spiritual work is the key to, is key to the work of hospital chaplains, but it can expose them to coronavirus being spread in the air or sometimes through touch. Jane Barnes, a chaplain at the Billings Clinic in Montana, was diagnosed with COVID-19 near Thanksgiving and has since recovered. She tries to avoid physical contact with COVID-19 patients, but it can be difficult to resist a brief touch, which is often the best way to convey compassion. It's almost an awkward moment when you see a patient in distress, but you know you shouldn't hold their hand or give them a hug, Barnes said. But that doesn't mean that we can't be there for them. These are people who cannot have visitors, and they have a lot they want to say. Sometimes they are angry with God, and they let me know about that. I'm there to listen. 
Still, there are times, Barnes said, that the despair is so profound she cannot help but put on a glove and hold a patient's hand. Barnes said because of her bout with the disease, she has a better understanding of what patients are enduring. Dealing with so much suffering affects even the most hardened doctors and nurses, she said. Billings Clinic staff members were devastated when a beloved physician died of COVID-19 and rallied behind a popular nurse who was seriously ill but recovered. We're not only taking care of the patients, we're also there for the staff, and I think we have been an important asset, she said, of the hospital's chaplains. In Abington, Pennsylvania, Pastor Marshall Mitchell of Salem Baptist Church said he believes part of his spiritual duty is to persuade his congregation and the broader African-American community to take precautions to avoid COVID-19. That is why Mitchell allowed photographers to capture the moment in December when he received his first dose of a vaccine. As pastor of one of the largest churches in the Philadelphia region, it is incumbent on me to demonstrate the powers of both science and faith, he said. Mitchell said he might have credibility in convincing other African-Americans who have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19 that a vaccine can save lives. Many are skeptical. The politicization of COVID-19 precautions, such as masks and social distancing, has put many pastors in a difficult position. Mitchell said he has no patience for people who refuse to wear masks. I keep them the hell away from me, he said. Jeff Wheeler, lead pastor of Central Church in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, said that his church encourages mask wearing and that most congregants comply but the underlying tension is reflected in his message to members on the church's website. It says, as we move forward, we simply ask you to avoid shaming, judging, or making critical comments to those wearing or not wearing masks. Sheikh Tariq Atta, who leads the Orange County Islamic Foundation in California, said that the Quran calls for Muslims to take actions to ensure their health and that congregants largely comply with COVID-19 guidelines. So, our members don't have a problem with mask mandates, he said. COVID-19 has hit the Orange County Muslim population hard, Atta said. Religion has become an important source of comfort for members who have lost their jobs and struggled with illness or finding childcare. Our faith says that no matter how difficult the situation, we always have access to God and the future will be better, Atta said. Adam Morris the rabbi at Temple Micah in Denver said he has turned to online video to meet with congregants sick with the coronavirus. When meeting with his congregation members in person, such as during graveside services, he worries that with his mask on, people might miss seeing the concern and compassion he feels for their plight. He conducts in-person graveside funerals for a small number of mourners, but requires all participants to wear masks. Observant Muslims and Jews believe it is important to bury the dead quickly after death, Morris said. Some traditions and rituals must go forward, Morris said, COVID or not. Okay, we're going to turn to our conversation for today, and I'd like to introduce my guests to you. I've been really looking forward to this conversation, Monica H. Green is an independent scholar specializing in the history of medicine in the Middle Ages. Although trained as a Europeanist, she has long recognized the intimate ties between Europe and the Islamic world, both of which suffered from the devastations of plague, both in the Middle Ages and again at the end of the medieval period. That work led her to explore the significance of new findings from genetics, which tells a story of plague's effects well beyond the confines of Europe. She's currently working on two books, a History of the Medical Translations of the 11th Century Monk Constantine the African, and The Black Death, a global history which looks at the spread of plague throughout Eurasia and Africa. We have an additional guest who will be joining us momentarily. I believe he's working out his internet connection at the moment. Tunahan Dermas is a first-year PhD researcher in the Department of History and Civilization at the European University Institute in Florence. His research mainly focuses on Ottoman history with a special interest in social and cultural aspects of disease. He specifically studies how urban communities of the Ottoman Empire and the world around them perceived the concept of disease in the 17th century and how those perceptions changed over time. Dermaz earned his master's degree at Sabansi University in Istanbul with a thesis titled Family Companions and Death, Sayyid Hassan Nuri Effendi's Microcosm, which sounds like fascinating work. And I see that 
Tunahan has rejoined us here, and it is my pleasure to welcome you both to COVID Calls. Thanks for making time to join me today. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'd like to start the way I usually do, which is just to find out where you're calling from and what the pandemic situation is there right now. Tunahan, may I start with you, please? Yes, sure. Thanks again. I mean, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm connecting to you from down the hills of Fiesole, uh, a small town in Tuscany, Italy, that also Boccaccio's stories of play take place. Uh, as you may know, Italy uses a four color based system to categorize its 20 regioni on the basis of the current risk and the necessary measures to be taken accordingly. Uh, from less risk to the highest risk, uh, it's white, yellow, orange and red. And there are no white or red zones in the county for the moment. But in where I live, Tuscany, there has been an upsurge in the number of cases uh, in, the, in the last week, today being 911. I, I recently checked it. So we shifted uh, recently from yellow zone to orange, orange zone. This is, this is the case in, uh, in where I live right at the moment. And just one quick follow up. What's the situation in terms of getting to campus? Are you able to work on campus? And also, are you able to work in archives? Or are you having to work in a solitary fashion at this time? Well, in it is, when it is in yellow zone, it's, I mean, it's, it us, they usually continue the hybrid system uh, in the campus. Uh, but I mean, it's just, you know, we continued the education in situ as well uh, when it was yellow zone. But now uh, it's not the case. I mean, everything moved online again. But as researchers, I mean, uh, we are still thankfully able to uh, visit uh, campus on a limited basis for the moment. So it's just, you know, I can, I, can, I can benefit from the library and I'm thankful for that. Monica, same question. Where are you calling from and what's it looking like there today? I'm in Phoenix, uh, where we've had uh, about as much of a winter as we ever get here in Phoenix, which means it's um, probably in the 70s today. Um, we are not in uh, lockdown. I'm not sure um, what, uh, if any legal restrictions are um, in place currently. Um, I have had to venture out uh, a couple of times in, in the last few days, and I was uh, impressed that professionals, um, so all businesses, um, uh, have fully accepted uh, the, um, uh, the need to, to, to wear masks themselves and to ask their clients to wear masks. Mm. Um, so uh, that's, that part of it has been, been widely adopted. Um, there are vaccinations going on here. I'm 64, uh, which puts me just under uh, the limit of being uh, eligible for uh, vac uh, vaccination right now. Um, so just, um, you know, people being patient. Well, I'm glad that you're both doing well. And I'm really going to, again, thank you for, for joining me today. I want to follow up a little bit. I'm going to Monica, come back to you in just a second. Tunan, let me ask you um, first, because you bring a unique perspective here, uh, I think you can tell us a little bit about your experience of the pandemic in Turkey, and then also having moved to Italy. I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit, and, and specifically also how, um, how the impact of the pandemic has caused you to see your own research differently, if it has. Okay, so uh, let me start with your last question. Uh, and then move to the first one uh, as for my experiences. Well, my arrival in the field of history of disease was in fact not by choice. I mean, like many historians who eventually came with a bigger field of inquiry en route to some medals, uh, I stumbled upon disease and plague while working on a diary uh, written by a dervish uh, from the Ottoman capital Istanbul in the 17th century. Uh, I hope to find a chance to talk about it a bit more uh, further. Um, but sh to shortly mention now, uh, the protagonist starts his diary in the summer of 1661, when an epidemic disease, likely the bubonic plague, hit the urban population of the city extremely hard. Uh, and then he draws a terrifying picture of the event, taking note of the disease stricken people, counting the number of diseased people, but most importantly, giving an insider's perspective reach perspective of the disease, especially in terms of emotional attitudes toward the sickening and death of the loved ones. Being struck by this, 
my mind was completely set and I was going to focus on the cultural attitudes toward disease in the 17th century and I did so for a long while. But last year changed many things. Uh, I was studying the history of epidemics and pandemics, but I have never exper experienced something like that in my life before, like everyone else. Uh, and I was testifying that those things, I mean, they are still, they can still harshly disrupt our modern lives. So it was in a way, a historical continuity. Uh, so the most valuable and crucial thing uh, from the very beginning, as, as we have all seen, was the epidemiological data and its proper interpretation. But I realized that this was lacking in my historical research. I mean, on the grounds of being a cultural historian, I completely ignored um, epidemiological part of the story. But it's quite obvious that if you will study the history of disease, you cannot ignore its many aspects. And now, I mean, uh, I'm trying to approach to the history of disease through a range of aspects and evidence from historical epidemiology to biological, bioarchaeological evidence. Uh, as for your second question, sh very shortly, it's not very easy to answer this for me at the moment. I mean, to be honest, as I'm still experiencing the very same process. I mean, a process of transition. So I cannot really talk about the differences, but I could speak of one commonality, one big commonality, which was the fear caused by the unpredictable nature of both the spread of the disease and the concomitant conditions of life in both the countries. Uh, I'm, thank you for that. And uh, one of the many reasons I love to talk to fellow historians is that you're you're thinking about events that have happened 400 almost years ago and then toggling back and forth between that and the way you're perceiving events today. And I think that's uh, an important perspective and part of a method um, that we employ, but also has, I think, increasing value, I hope, to public health officials. That's one of the things we're gonna talk about today, how that reflection on deep history is not just something we all do, but actually has import for the way we're looking at this, at this pandemic. Monica, I uh, was so glad you could take time to uh, join me for the second time on COVID calls. You were with me on May 13th, and we also had Jacob mm -hmm. Steer Williams that day. The death toll in the United States at that point was 83,648. It's, yeah. it's many pandemics ago, I think, in some ways. And I just wanted to sort of get an update from you as a person I know who's doing your history, but also following politics and everything else. What have you seen since May? that has brought you up short and really made you, you know, think about this pandemic perhaps differently, even from the way you were looking at it at that time? I think that I'm not, I would have to go back and look at notes and tweets and um, things from that period. And I, I have had no time to reflect um, uh, on what's happened the past year cumulatively um, because so much is still happening. Um, my, I think my sense last May is still pretty much the sense that I have now is that, oh my gosh, we have all of this amazing science and we're not using it. We're not using it in the way um, that we should to be um, uh, implementing the, uh, the changes in, in our behavior and our priorities. Um, that we should. So that's one of the things that I have said um, when people start to make comparisons between now and the Middle Ages is whatever was happening in the Middle Ages, they didn't have the science that we have. Um, they didn't have the explanations about uh, causes and modes of transmission. And uh, we do. And yet um, so much of the experience that we've had here in the United States has been a rejection of the implications of that. And the comparison between the United States and New Zealand, uh, Vietnam, and there's uh, several other exemplary um, uh, countries that have uh, acted in, in very different ways. I think that's going to be haunting us for a very, very long time. Um, uh, I have been 
uh, amazed at the science, but again, I, I think as, as uh, uh, anybody who's watched the vaccine process work, um, they will tell you immediately that and most of the, shall we say, infrastructure of the vaccine development was already in place. Um, and, and that was the big reason why they were able to uh, develop the vaccines so um, uh, quickly and, uh, and then put them into the phase three trials. Um, I've been very saddened, uh, frankly, uh, watching what has happened this past year. Very, very saddened as a historian. And in Arizona, you have a front row seat to also the, um, really the tension and the political struggles with this disaster has been filtered through American electoral politics. I wonder if you saw anything there in October, November that, um, I don't know if surprise is the right word, but that you reflected on, you know, perhaps also with your historian's hat on saying, wow, we've seen some of this before. Well, this, the, the, the surprise there was Arizona went blue, as right. you recall. Um, right. And I haven't, um, again, I haven't had time to go back and, and uh, take my raw emotional recollections and, and compare them against um, actual data. But my sense is the role that um, the indigenous populations here in Arizona played mm -hmm. in that really radical transformation of the political landscape here was massive. And their experience of this disease has been massive. And their response to the situation has been massive. Um, and they know their own history. They know the, the, the role that infectious diseases have played in the, the, the shaping and the, the contours of indigenous life um, here in the Americas. Um, I have been in awe um, of, of the response by the Native American communities. And I, I, I have so many things on my plate, I don't know that I'm ever going to do um, any deep study of, of the COVID experience, but that would be definitely one that I would love to do, um, is to, uh, uh, to take this, the, the absolute seriousness uh, uh, with which the, the epidemic was, was recognized and responded to. Just a reminder, you're listening to COVID Calls, and you can get your questions into the YouTube live chat, or you can put them up on Twitter, and just be sure to tag at US of Disaster. Also, I'm broadcasting for the first time on Twitch, which is not only for video games, and um, this is uh, an experiment with that, and if you're watching on Twitch, be sure to get in touch with me as well. You can also get questions in by email to sgk23 at drexel.edu. Let's turn a little bit to the discussion of plague and Monica, and I want to start with you on this. Just kind of a general question to start, and then we're going to go into multiple layers of this, but I'm sure you get this question a lot. How, you know, as an expert in plague, which is an old disease, what's the point of studying that um, in terms of a way to reflect on COVID-19? What's useful in that kind of an examination of an old disease, which can help us perhaps get some perspective on COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, which is an em emerging infectious disease. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, emerging is a relative term, uh, of, of course. Plague was an emerging disease at one point. Um, uh, and so the concept of emerging disease, of course, has to do with it's new, um, it's unfamiliar, its behavior is unfamiliar, there are no uh, tried and tested uh, uh, therapies or cures um, for it. And, uh, well, you know, the development of vaccination is really, aside from smallpox, a uh, phenomenon of about the last 150 years. Um, what a, an emerging disease in, in that sense is, is um, uh, it's a way to gauge uh, and reckon with the psychological response that um, uh, the disease event causes. Um, there are, there are um, other ways to, uh, to think about it too in terms of, of the concept of emerging disease, but I want to skip um, ahead to a, a different way, and that is 
And this is essentially um, why I've become involved in uh, the plague research is because there's been a revolution in the way we can reconstruct the history of uh, infectious diseases. And that's because of uh, the ability now to retrieve and study the genetic remains, the genetic fossils of pathogens from the past. And um, plague was the poster child for that development. Plague, uh, just it was just 10 years ago that the um, uh, sequences of Yersinia pestis, the bacterium that causes plague, uh, these were retrieved from a Black Death Cemetery in London. And everything since then has been different in terms of the kinds of questions we can ask um, uh, about the disease. And anybody who's been paying attention this past year knows the ways in which genetics has also played a similar role in our tracking of uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, uh, there are uh, special websites uh, for that. The, the one I've used most is Next Train. Um, but they are, um, there's, uh, they're, they've been sequencing the virus really since, uh, what was it, January 5th of last year was uh, when they had the, the first genomic sequence for, for the virus. Thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of sequences that are available now. And that's why we know all the variants that are um, developing in the UK, in South Africa, in Brazil. That's why we're able to track them in their movements um, into new countries and into uh, uh, different zones. That's all the same science uh, in principle that is now being used historically to look at the evolution of pathogens. And uh, so that's been the foundation of, of what I do. And what it does is by looking at the history of the pathogen separate from human reports about the experience of the disease, it gives you a different perspective. It's like mm -hmm. you have entirely other witnesses that you never had before and you never could even dream that you would have before. And that's basically the foundation of the work that, that, that I've been doing is saying, how does, our, how does our picture, how does our story change when we look at this from the pathogen's perspective? Wow, the the genome as a as a witness as, as a corresponding body of data. Uh, what a remarkable methodological turn in terms of disease history. Tunahan, I want to give you sort of the same question. That again, this sort of broad landscape, the way you think about it. How does the plague, a deeper history of medicine, um, give you some sort of insight into COVID nineteen? Can you talk to us a little bit about your thinking there? Well, I, 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 I actually have nothing to add simply, I mean, because uh, I can only say that I'm very much intrigued by this, by this approach and it's just, you know, and in, in, the, in the last couple of months I've been, I mean, um, I've been intrigued by what this biological archive, as Monica calls it, I mean, uh, can offer us, uh, can offer to us historians and uh, this, is, this is basically what I can say. So Tanahan, just to follow up, um, maybe you could speak a little bit directly to, um, you know, your own understanding of the history of the Ottoman Empire um, as we try to put together, you know, as Monica is explaining, so a new way of thinking about the global history of pandemic. How does the Ottoman Empire and the Islamic world factor into that study? I think there's an increasing um, interest among scholars in weaving that history into the, the sort of broader history, which has often been treated as Europe and then the rest of the world, unfortunately. So, um, well, basically, I mean, um, I, maybe I cannot really relate it to, I mean, I'm, I'm not that much capable of relating, relating it to our current experience. Sure. Uh, but I mean, uh, yes, I mean, the, when we are talking about the Ottoman uh, or Islamic understanding of the disease, uh, or, or, or I mean, I'm just past pandemics, I mean, uh, they, were, they were largely ignored uh, in our, uh, in, in, in the current, even in the current historiography, I mean, until very recently. Um, so I mean, I mean, 
there were there were basic reasons for that because uh, this 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 the history the history of pandemics uh, and epidemics uh, was not uh, they did not include they did not very much include this world the Islamic world the wider Mediterranean region the Ottoman Empire um, but they also I mean had the uh, the, the historiography had its own understanding from only true uh, European sources, which uh, led away to a Euro Eurocentric understanding uh, of, uh, of, of, of the history of plague. Uh, so, I mean, basically I can give the example of fatalism, uh, the understanding of fatalism, uh, the, uh, the, the, the this Islamic or, I mean, Ottoman or Mediterranean story of of, of, of plague uh, was usually seen uh, through this lens. I mean, uh, people, uh, the attitudes were usually understood through uh, the, the notion of fatalism. I mean, the fatalism, I mean, by, by fatalism, I mean, it's just, you know, simply uh, an unresponsive attitude toward the disease. Uh, uh, if, mm -hmm. if I could just add an, uh, another factor here that is just the um, corollary of, of what uh, Tunahan is, is talking about here is one of the, the assessments that's been made of the experience of plague in the Islamic world is why didn't they develop quarantine? Mm. And quarantine obviously has been a big point of discussion uh, this past year. And um, it will continue to be a discussion because um, now that we have unequal vaccination rates throughout the world, there will be very big issues about how people travel um, in the coming uh, um, months or, or year. Uh, will we have to bring in um, uh, passports, uh, a kind of vaccination passports um, to, to document who has freedom to travel and, and and who does not. But the bigger point um, here is that, oh, and what I see, and, and this actually gets to the heart of the project um, that Tunahan and uh, and I and, and our, our colleague Nuket Varlik is, is working on, is we're making translations of these right. historical texts um, in uh, from Arabic, uh, from Persian. Um, there may be some other ones that, that are, are added to the list. And the reason is we want those documents to, to help tell the story, um, to help tell the story that the Islamic world, um, here are, uh, we're talking mostly the, the Western Islamic world and, and North Africa, had as much of a prolonged plague experience as Europe did. But when we teach the history of plague, we teach Boccaccio. Sure. Uh, we teach um, sources that are coming from England, and there is nothing wrong with that, uh, precisely because they experienced too, and and uh, and many of them wrote incredibly eloquently about those experiences. But it it would be like um, if we were telling you know a hundred years from now we were telling this the story of COVID nineteen, and we only told the American story. The whole world has experienced this, right. um, and what does it what does it say about our skill as historians, our, our ethos as historians, if we leave those other stories out? And what has been amazing, and this is why um, I'm involved in this project, and and Tuna can, can attest to this. I don't know Arabic, I don't know Persian. I'm not going to be making these these uh, translations, but I am collaborating um, with these project and collaborating with these uh, these scholars that have awesome expertise um, because I've been reading the genetics and the genetics says very, very clearly, this is the um, Four Black Deaths um, essay I, I published in December. The genetics says very clearly, plague was spread throughout Eurasia okay. or certainly uh, throughout Northern Eurasia. And if it was spreading through these, uh, across these, these vast ranges, it was because humans were spreading it. What the mechanisms, the precise mechanisms of, of spread remain um, to be determined, but we have stories we need to tell about um, 
the, the Middle East. And plague, we have stories that we need to tell about Central Asia. And the plague, we have stories we need to tell about Russia. Um, and the plague, we have stories we need to tell um, about East Asia um, and the plague. And that's why we as humanists, taking the impetus that the scientists have given us, need to go back to our text mm -hmm. and say, wow, wow, there were these things there that, 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 that we didn't see before. There's an awful lot to think about here. I just want to stay with the um, the grant that you won, and again to congratulate you for winning this grant from the LePage Thank Center, you. and uh, Tuna, and also to invite you to say anything you'd like to about your your role in it, and particularly reflecting on you know Monica's point um, about the way historiography has developed, and uh, that if if we've developed a Western focused historiography. Now we have these new insights from genomics, which are forcing us to reconsider that in addition to the broader cultural move, which I hope is well established at this point, that the history of civilization or the history of the West has left us pretty myopic in terms of the way we understand the history of disease. So I see your project is, is incredibly not only valuable in a, in a just sort of a nuts and bolts way, like what tools do historians need? But it also feels historiographically provocative, and I like that. I wonder, mm -hmm. Tunahan, if you could say a little more about mm -hmm. that. Yes, I mean, I mentioned the, I mean, especially in terms of the sources, uh, maybe it's just, you know, the Ottoman sources. I mentioned the importance of the, the non-Eurocentric approach, and this approach was deeply lacking, even within the Ottoman historiography until very recently. Uh, and uh, I want to pursue with fatalism here again, once again, the contemporary European travelers, I mean, extensively wrote how fatalistic the Ottomans were. I mean, uh, so this became the entrenched opinion in, histor in the historiography, but the voices of the Ottoman sources what was largely ignored in the making of this image. We possess, in fact, a wide variety of sources, ranging from first-person narratives to literary pieces, to archival documentation, and to, I mean, an amazing number of plague treatises, town resilient. Um, and those are all ready to tell us a more different story. I mean, uh, those are all uh, ready to make a difference, uh, I think. And therefore, it's vitally important to make these sources available in English for both historiographical and for ped pedagogical reasons as well. I mean, I strongly believe this will help shape a more nuanced understanding of the post pandemics and epidemics, along with these new set of evidences, evidence we have from the new genetics area. I want to, um, well, thanks for that description. I want to come back. Monica, you mentioned a minute ago a new uh, article that you'd published in the American Historical Review, which came out in December. And I think it's a culmination of work you've been doing for some time. And I want to, first of all, it's a tremendous piece and everyone should read it and we'll all be teaching it. I'm sure I'll be teaching it um, starting in two weeks. And I wonder, um, there's a lot in there. Um, and I was going to sort of ask you to hit some of the high points. I want to focus on one particular line that in there that brought me up short to really like you write, reckoning with invisible historical actors is a challenge unique to historians who research mm -hmm the pre-laboratory age. And I, I start with that part of the story because I think um, it has broad applicability beyond the history of pandemic or the history of medicine. I think right now we're in a, in a turn, historians who are trying to mobilize deep history in a number of different ways, who are bringing mm -hmm. history of geology, um, deep history of botany, anthropocenic research, to try mm -hmm. to bring, as you said earlier, other pieces of data which we've often left either left out or left to scientists to deal with. And now we're trying to reckon with those as important um, tools to reconstruct the past. So I'll turn it over to you to talk a little bit more about this piece, but particularly this, this thing about reckoning with the invisible data, well, the, the witness, as you said, the genetic witness. What a, what a profound way to come at this problem. Well, I... I I can take credit for it, but I also have to um, acknowledge my influences. And a big influence has been reading climate historians um, uh, for the past decade. Climate history is so far ahead of where disease history is right now. Climate history has just kind of shot ahead and embraced the sciences, embraced the ways in which 
the sciences reckon with the physical world. And they have developed these techniques for climate history. It's ice core sampling, um, dendrochronology, you know, a variety of other different uh, tools. For disease history, it's mostly been this uh, kind of paleogenetics that, that I have been telling um, about. But it is my, uh, where, where I come in as a historian is saying, wait a minute, you have evidence? <laughs> you have new evidence that we have never had before? Give me some. Let me see it. Let me analyze it. And let me think about the implications of it. And the fact that it's invisible, the example I often use is this. Um, uh, so uh, we have every reason now to believe that that plague was not simply in Europe. It was also in China, in late medieval China. I don't read Chinese. I have to rely on those colleagues who publish in languages I can read. But when I read their work on Chinese history, I read it critically. I read it as a historian. I say, what is the evidence? Um, that you're drawing on, how are you interpreting the uh, the evidence? Does it make a clear and coherent argument? Exact same thing that I would do kind of reading any time I'm reading outside my own specialty, which is the same thing we all do as historians. Well, I've taken that same principle and applied it to the science, saying, what is the evidence? Um, what, how, date, well, how have you dated it? Um, how have you related it to, uh, to, to other phenomena? And once that, 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 that researcher has earned my trust that they're working competently, they're working thoroughly, um, then I put my trust in them and say, okay, now I'm going to take their conclusions and see what the implications of those uh, conclusions are. So that's where I am about the, the invisibility of it. I can't see. Uh, those microbes. Any, I mean, even they're talk. They're 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 working with. Um, so the the uh, uh, the genome of Yersinia pestis is about four point six million base pairs long. They're working with fragments as small as fifty base pairs long. Mm -hmm. I uh, I mean the 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 technical achievement that has has developed in this field is is simply awe inspiring. Um, but again, it, it comes back to the same thing. Does it tell a persuasive story? Um, and, and what can I do with it? And it told this story, which, you know, as I was rec re recognizing the, the significance of it, it just kind of made my eyes bug out, which is something happened before the Black Death that the Black Death narratives that we have learned from Boccaccio and um, uh, these other uh, European chroniclers is an epiphenomenon of something else that had happened earlier. And that's what, the, and it's the geneticist who, who, who um, gave it this epithet, the Big Bang. And I think that the Big Bang happened in the 13th century. Um, I, I think I it happened. And the interesting, and this is where, again, the, the parallel with our modern concept of emerging diseases and the research that's going on right now with uh, COVID-19 is where did it come from? How did this happen? How did that emergence um, uh, come about? What was the spillover? So a, um, um, an organism that has been developing in an animal population spills over into a human population. So what's the impetus that causes that to happen? They're spending hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of dollars doing this research now um, for uh, SARS-CoV-2. I just figured it out for the Black Death, or I think I figured it out um, mm -hmm. for, uh, uh, for the Black Death. And that's the part also that's sobering to me is the Black Death was the largest pandemic in human history. And we're only now figuring out the cause of it. Um, that's really sobering, and that's that. What that says to me is, maybe that's why our response this past year has been so pathetic. Is that we haven't taken pandemics serious? I mean, it's as as contra self contradictory as that sounds. We haven't taken pandemics seriously enough. Um, 
and so anyway, I think that's the, the that's one of the, the the things of that comes from it's a willingness to believe. Um, frankly, this the, uh, these aren't ghost stories that the scientists are 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 telling. This is a material history that they have been able to to reconstruct on a microscopic level. It's simply awesome. Just a reminder, you're listening to COVID Calls. We're talking today about the history of plague and the implications for COVID-19 with Tunahan Dumas and Monica Green. I want to stay with um, a couple of things you said there, Monica, and also Tunahan, give you a chance to comment if you'd like to. What are the implications, Monica, to you first, of moving the, the Black Death, moving, moving plague history, um, but particularly the outbreak that we tend to refer to in um, textbooks as the Black Death, moving that timeline back, first of uh -huh. all, significantly, and then also showing the geographic reach of it to be much broader than had been previously understood. And as mm -hmm. you said, this is something, that story has been with us for a long time. Even people who don't study history have a general sense, oh yeah, there was the Black Death, it was in Europe, it was in some time around the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's knowledge that's out there and we're just now getting closer to some deeper understanding of it. So I wonder if you could just say a little bit more about the implications of those findings. First of all, um, the uh, the word I haven't said yet in our conversation today is um, the of the Black is uh, the way I have recorded it, and um, you know I expect that there will now. Be uh, uh, maybe a generation of studies that are pulling my my conclusions of, uh, apart, but we'll see. The, but the story I have reconstructed is that um, the Mongols at the beginning of the 13th century, these campaigns of uh, first raids um, and then campaigns of conquest against neighbors to the south, neighbors to the west, neighbors to the east. And these are uh, military campaigns uh, in terms of the basic logistic of a military campaign. You have to feed your soldiers. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I think is happening is, is two things that, that uh, uh, very quickly each other, which is the, the animals that maintain or seem to have maintained the uh, the uh, Yersinia pestis strain involved in, in the Black Death. Uh, these are marmots. Um, uh, they're uh, marmots in a, uh, still found in a uh, range uh, in Kyrgyzstan. Um, and uh, marmots are hibernating animals. Um, they have thick furs, a lot of fat um, on them. Uh, uh, there are, it is very well documented that they are used um, as food uh, sources. Um, and they're used as a fur source and their, their, their hides are also canned into leather. And um, so they're um, a, a trifecta of use for, for the marmots. So those marmots live in the mountains, at the foothills of the mountains. There's some phenomenal um, agricultural lands, which had been for quite some time a very high quality of millet. And uh, the Mongols pack up the millet and take it on their campaigns with them. Um, and so what I'm uh, postulating is that there's a spillover of marmots, um, plague into local rodent populations, uh, anybody who is uh, involved in, in uh, grain agriculture knows that uh, nobody loves grain uh, more than ro rodents do. Um, so there will always be rodents around um, where you're uh, growing the grain, when you're gleaning uh, the, the, the bits and pieces that fall to the ground after you've collected it, um, in granaries where you're storing it. Um, I mean, constant universal um, problem of our involvement of, of grain agriculture. Um, so that is the circumstance. 
But then when you look at what the Mongols were and what the Mongols, the Mongols were the largest land empire in human history. So you get the largest land empire in human history, in my interpretation, causing the largest pandemic in human history. It's not a coincidence. Um, but, and, and this, this is a very important point that I've made. And I've been reading public health. I've been reading global health uh, literature, epidemiology for um, more than two decades now. Um, I want us to learn how to speak respectfully about what it is we do as humans. And this is, again, a good model that I have been learning from climate history people is how to talk about the Anthropocene. Mm. And the Anthropocene, of course, is, is meant to say that um, the disturbances in the climate, the um, plastic pollution, you know, the, we all know the, the, the list now, which is causing many of the climate changes um, that we're experiencing uh, right now. We did it. We as humans did it. Our, our efforts, our desire for, uh, for fuel, for energy, for travel. Um, I mean, the, again, the, the, the list goes on. And I'm seeing that's pretty much the same story. We can, we can t talk about pandemics too. Um, that, and I think that's really important for us to do is to, um, and, and, and this isn't a blame game. Um, it's an honesty exercise. Mm -hmm of saying, we want these things. We want fancy gadgets. We want to travel. We want to get on our, our jet planes um, and, uh, and, and go places. Uh, we want our factories to, to churn out cars and um, uh, sure. other machines that we want. And I think what the concept of the Anthropocene is, is giving us is a sense of, okay, there's also a reckoning. And I see the, the pandemic that we've endured this past year as part of that reckoning um, of we are, and, and again, and this is why it was predicted. I mean, uh, uh, this again is, is why I as a historian am feeling um, demoralized by the response this, this past year is, I mean, and you've had many of other the guests you've had on your show are, are among these people who have been sure. um, uh, predicting a, a, a pandemic for, for um, several years now. And even the, the whole notion of the emerging disease is part of, 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 of this effort that's been going on 30 years now uh, to say we don't have the control over nature that we'd like to think that we do. Hmm. Um, and we need to reckon with that. I'm particularly impressed with the idea of, of taking a, a 700 plus year old story into that, into that reckoning. And mm -hmm. at, at the same time, um, Tunahan, let me bring you in on, on this. I have a, a concern that has, was always sort of there, was heightened over this last year as I watched um, Dumbstruck the way that the origin story of SARS-CoV-2 became weaponized politically in the United States, not only in the United States, but particularly uh, in the United States. And I'm not going to repeat the language that was used, but this idea that you have the, the virus as a sort of a foreign invader that comes into the placid, health, healthy United States, and that that's the cause um, for the economic wreckage and the, and the human health wreckage of the of the pandemic. So I just want to I want to put that out there because that's been a lively part of the American political scene for a long time but in this case for this past year. So with that on the table, I do wonder, you know, as you bring the Islamic world into the history of pandemic, as you bring Monica as you said, bringing the Mongol the Mongol empire into the history of the Black Death, that tells us a more complete story, certainly, a much richer, more nuanced history. I wonder about the sort of political implications of that, because it is bringing people into the story who, in more recent times in the West, we've continued to villainize 
and consider the other and consider dangerous. So it's not even a very well-formed question. It's just more of a concern that I have about, not that you shouldn't do this work, but what do you foresee as sort of telling a better historical narrative? How might that impact the way we talk about disease as an invader, as an other, as an outsider? Tona, I don't know if you have any, any insights into that. Let me give you a first uh, opportunity to respond and then Monica bring you in. Yes, I mean, I would, I would just shortly talk about this. I'm, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not in a position to talk about the political implications today. I mean, but I can just give a very simple uh, example uh, of that. You know, so the study, the understanding. I mean, basically, a global understanding of pandemics uh, can shed light on. Uh, simply, it's just can 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 enlighten or can dissolve our very biased understandings. Uh, this is this is this is what I'm thinking. I mean, for instance, um, the Islamic world, the Ottomans, or the East was generally seen as the origin of the disease in Europe for so long, uh, for so long. Uh, but uh, the story, the, the story behind this was even more complicated when you in, when, when when you take into account uh, the sources from these spheres as well. It makes it even more complicated, and uh, and with, the, with maybe this, you know, this this new set of evidence uh, this from 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 genet from new genetics. I mean, uh, we 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 will be able to, I mean, uh, make a better story of that. Uh, this is this is what I believe, and um, the sources, the new sources. I mean, the sources from uh, the Islamic world and the Ottoman world. I mean, will definitely make it make it a more nuanced. Uh, story. It would certainly complicate the idea that um, the Muslim world was the source somehow of Western Europe's um, you know, decimation in the in the Black Death. And I also can't help but think that greater facility with those sources would enable empathy. And I think that's what you were saying, a sort of global history of pandemic may dissolve some of these uh, angers and prejudices because empathetic understanding of history we know is a tool um, that does dissolve prejudice. It's not a magic tool, but it's a, it is a valuable tool. Monica, your thoughts on this sort of set of ideas? I've got well, I have a lot um, uh, of thoughts on this. It's, it, but it goes back to my, um, uh, my concern that we acknowledge humans doing what humans do. Humans got to eat. Um, uh, there are kind of different, um, uh, there was probably a different moral code that I, I would take if I was talking about the military activities of the Mongols. But in terms of, of, of um, the Mongols' concern that they feed themselves, that's universal. The reason why plague comes into Europe is because the Italians are importing grain from the Mongol world. They want to feed themselves because they're they're um, in a situation of famine that had been going on for for several years just prior to uh, 1347. Um, so I don't think I don't think even the 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 use of a category of blame is um, helpful for for any kind of analysis that that we're doing at a period when nobody knew what bacteria were. Um, where um, everybody, as far as I can tell, was as perplexed as anybody else about why is this happening. And I would add, too, that, um, and this is a just stunning um, contrast between the Islamic world and Europe. Both the Islamic world and Europe have resident minority populations of Jews. It's only in Europe that there are, are systematic pogroms against these communities. So what we do, I mean, I think, and I consider this uh, just as true right now, is what we do in response to crisis is what our moral judgment should be. Um, so I don't see, uh, again, and I, I, I said this, this, this earlier, um, I don't see anybody in the 13th or 14th century to have been in a position to know why this was happening 
or in, in a position to intervene materially um, to, to stop it from continuing um, to happen. So I don't see, um, I don't see that the, 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 the rhetoric of blame does, does anybody um, any good uh, for that. And even just the whole notion of, of, again, what the ultimate source is in terms of the, the um, geography of, of a disease. Um, yes, there is a tendency to, you know, to engage in, um, in that. And that's why the WHO and, and, and epidemiologists in general were decisive last year and, and um, uh, bravo to them for saying, rejecting any geographic specification in how we refer to this, this new disease because it does nobody any good. The point is, how do you react when it's, it's on, your, uh, on your doorstep? Um, how the United States reacted is, is, is not gonna make anybody proud. Um, I, and just to come back to one thing you, you said there, the, the reaction, the political and cultural reaction um, of othering, of blame, and that doesn't, certainly doesn't save lives. And yet we see it as a historical form of continuity. Of course, it's in different contexts and in, in different times. And I don't know, I guess I'm a bit of, I go back and forth if I'm an optimist or a pessimist, so that maybe that's, it's too, that binary is not one I should worry about too much, but um, it has been a little bit dis dispiriting, I have to say, to know the history of reaction to pandemic in terms of xenophobia and violence, to see it invoked yet again mm -hmm. last year. Yes. Um, when we know that um, at a very basic level in the past, if you just took that as a public health measure, it just never worked. Mm -hmm. So why would we continue to invoke that just on a basic, you know, a sort mm -hmm. of basic level, just to cut, um, cut right to the to the center of it? And it and it maybe it opens up a possibility again for a crossover between um, pandemic planning, public health, medicine, and history. Mm -hmm. um, that mm -hmm. awareness of these previous cases and the continuity of those kinds of things like xenophobia and, and violence in the face of pandemic has never worked. Building walls around cities has never worked. Mm -hmm. So let's not traffic in that kind of discussion again. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. Monica, what, what do you think? How do you get this kind of message across or your work across to readers who are not historians like the three of us in this conversation? Uh, well, the fact of the matter is I haven't gotten <laughs> this message across. Um, I've uh, been delightfully um, uh, uh, surprised by the reaction to the, the, the piece in the EHR, but I've been doing this work, um, uh, publishing on Plague and, and trying to make these arguments about the value of reconceiving our history of infectious diseases. I've been doing this for seven years now. Uh, I've been teaching it for even longer, and um, I, th I think maybe some of it's it's uh, getting through, but uh, I think too little, um, and that's why we need to keep having these these uh, discussions of saying these are the things that we can learn uh, uh, from history. These are the things we haven't learned yet. And maybe we should. Maybe sh we should be um, investing. I have uh, people who know me know I have I've said this multiple times. If a fraction of the money that's going into the genetic work would also pay for a historian, the transformation that we would see would be enormous. I mean, we historians are so cheap. Um, I mean, maybe we shouldn't talk. Like that. Um, maybe maybe we should we should uh, up our market value, um, but um, the, the, again the, the transformation. I, I did this because the all the work that I've I've been doing on plague is because I knew that the story I was telling my students in my classes wasn't persuasive. You know that all of a sudden this this 
phenomenally destructive disease just comes out of nowhere. It's just like, right. that's not possible. Right. You know, it makes no sense. It makes no sense as biology. It makes no sense in terms of what we know about human commerce. Um, and that's why I started reading uh, the genetics work. Um, and basically just I followed the breadcrumbs um, to, to see what the, um, what the implications were. And that's what the researchers are doing now with the, you know, the origin of, of SARS is they're going to keep at it until um, they have a persuasive argument. Because the thing is, is that we already know it can happen. So the question is, will it happen again? Right. And, and, and not simply can it happen, it has happened and we haven't controlled it. Um, and that is a very, very, I watch the stories about the transmission of, of COVID-19 into animal populations. So we've heard a lot about the, the mink farms um, where they can control uh, the animals. They can cull the animals if they need to. Um, what scares me is the, the thought of, of the disease passing into wild animal populations, mm -hmm. uh, which is exactly why, why we lived with plague for so long. We, I have, that's what I should have put in my, my report at the beginning is I live in Arizona. We have plague here. Right. Um, we have plague here be, because it was never controlled mm. in the Middle Ages. We're almost up on time. And just a reminder, you're listening to COVID calls. Tunahan, I want to come back to you. you, you the two of you come together, um, a shared intellectual interest, and also this project that you're doing around translation. And I, I always like to get a little specific if we can. And Tunahan, could you just maybe tell us about one source that's, um, that you're working on that's sure, going through pleasure. this translation process? Sure. I mean, uh, I think it's better for me to talk about the study that I mentioned in the beginning. Um, I mean, uh, I've been translating uh, some parts from this diary uh, of, a of, of, of a 17th century dervish uh, lived in Istanbul. Uh, and he extensively wrote uh, about uh, about his experiences of plague. I mean, um, I think it's, it, needs, it needs some more evidence to call it bubonic plague, but I think it's bubonic plague. Uh, but there's a certain epidemic that struck uh, Istanbul at that time. And the diarist uh, extensively writes about the casualties by giving their names, and which also includes some members from his family, um, his wife, two sons, a niece, and many other acquaintances. And he gives specific details uh, from uh, the time when someone uh, got plague chicken to the times of their death and to the funeral arrangements uh, and everything. I mean, it's a very tragic image. Uh, he counts the number of the coffins and they, they simply cannot, I mean, cannot keep up with the uh, coffin requests uh, at that time. I mean, it's, it's just, just such a big thing. And it usually took away children. Uh, I mean, I've been still struggling with this question. Uh, it's just, I mean, uh, the diarist, I mean, most of the people, uh, most of the casualties that he lists include uh, children. Uh, I don't know what kind, of, uh, what kind of thing this could tell us, uh, but um, I mean, I, 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 I simply talked about this uh, in, in, in Experiencing Epidemics podcast. I mean, I could recommend this one as well. I could give you the link for more details uh, in the next thing. Uh, but this is one source that I've been translating, and there will be some others as well. Yeah, we lost you. I think I lost just your last sentence there, Tunahan, from the audio. Could you just say that last? OK, I'm, uh, sure. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, you came back. Okay. Okay, great. I mean, uh, I've, I've been simply translating this source uh, right at the moment, and I will keep translating some parts from it as well. Uh, and uh, there will be some others uh, too okay. uh, on the road. Thank you. And it sounds like, again, back to some things we were talking about before, not only is it deepen our, our understanding and, and um, complicate the archive, which is what we want, but also as a source where even your detail, you're talking about running out of coffins. That's yeah. a kind of a note 
that is the basis for an empathetic understanding across yeah. time. Incredibly yeah. valuable mm -hmm. in that regard. We're, um, we're almost out. In fact, I've kept my guests too long and I knew I would today because of all of the uh, issues I wanted to get to. But Monica, I wanna give you the last word on this and it's really about um, historical training. You talked about the way you've been drawing from climate change history work and I have two, we share that in common. But I know uh, it, it really adds um, to the list of skills that we may be asking analysts to develop. Uh, mm -hmm. And this ancient DNA work that you're writing with and about the A DNA is a is an entirely new area for many researchers to try to to try to take on. Can you talk a little bit about the way you think historical we talked about method, but the way historical training can change should change at this time to try to take on board some of these new skills. I think that I don't want to ask any uh, substantial group of historians to do what I did. Um, uh, I largely um, self-taught for the past uh, decade, but also I had um, uh, biologists, bioarchaeologists who essentially took pity on me um, and uh, were willing to and explain uh, you know some very uh, stuff and um, I've actually not had anybody uh, uh, any biologists or geneticists comment the HR uh, essay yet so it might be that they're just sitting there <laughs> why is everybody saying this wonderful when it's got you know errors on a single page um, nobody said that um, to me yet uh, but the point is that uh, we do need some kind of venues, even if they're temporary venues, where people from the different disciplines of relevance can, can come together. Um, and hard work, um, interdisciplinary dialogue is, 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 is quite hard work. It takes a lot of patience, it takes trust, um, and it takes some, some shared goals. What I am trying to do, and this is the, the uh, 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 aside from the, the um, individual work that Tunahan, uh, uh, Nuket Varlek and I are doing, we've also convened an online group to talk about these issues of, of translating um, sources from the Islamic world uh, having to do with infectious disease history. We have 42 people who are contributing um, to that. And the session we had uh, at the beginning of this month, I did my spiel about, you know, genetics and um, here's a phylogenetic tree um, and everything. And I think Tunahan can attest um, that it's not some, that they're concepts and abstractions that aren't necessarily immediately obvious. What I'm trying to do, and this is why um, I have repeatedly tried to develop concepts that I can give to historians to say, what is evolution? It's change over time. What do we do as historians? We do change over time. Um, the biological archive, it's just like, you know, you work, go into um, the National Archives in France, except <laughs> all these microbes. Um, and uh, so to create some kind of conceptual space there where we can see that this is a shared enterprise of reconstructing um, the past. There are certain fundamental concepts that yes, we need to learn. Um, uh, we need to know what a genome is. Uh, uh, we need, need to know how cells replicate. Um, but you know, there, we all have areas of uh, specialization. Not everybody needs to learn uh, all these skills, all these methods, all the jargon. Um, but we all have a sense now. Every single one of us has a sense now that pandemics are real. That pandemics, and it's, it's not simply the mortality count that is of historical significance. There are all these, th this pandemic has touched all our lives and it has touched many, many aspects of our lives. Um, that's what we do as historians. 
is we um, we acknowledge these historical trans uh, transitions, and then we to attempt to explain them. Um, and that's what I'm trying to do is say, there's been a lot of these in human history. This is not the first time, this is not the first pandemic. Um, and there's ways in which societies become inured um, to this. There are, you know, certain, I mean, just again, to take uh, quarantine, the concept of the, the, the legal grounding of quarantine and many, many elements of that are established in the late Middle Ages. Um, so we're still living with the, the, the relics of that pandemic past. We're still living with pandemics. Smallpox is the only disease that's been eradicated. Right. Um, SARS-1 disappeared, um, uh, seems to have disappeared on its own. Uh, but we're still living with tuberculosis. We're still living with measles. <sighs> we're still living with so many um, conditions because we have become inured to them. And I'm, I don't want to become inured to, mm -hmm. to COVID-19. Um, and I, I wish more people had been on that bandwagon a year ago. Just a reminder, you've been listening to COVID calls and you can catch COVID calls every weekday, 5 p.m. Eastern time. It's been a special discussion today in partnership with the LePage Center for History and the Public Interest of Villanova University. And I wanna thank my guests, Tunahan Dermaz and Monica Green for an inspiring session and to take some time out of your very busy research uh, uh, schedule to talk to us about what you've been working on. Thanks to both of you for your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure. Stay healthy, everybody. We'll see you right back here at 5 p.m. Eastern time tomorrow.